Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a very special program. I'm Diane Stern, a Salem Athenaeum trustee. And tonight we're at Hamilton Hall, which is hosting an exhibit this summer that's called Unmasking and Evolution of Negro Election Day and the Black Vote. While chapter and verse has been written about Salem's 17th century witchcraft hysteria, its maritime history, its distinguished white authors and architects, little is widely known about the deep roots of Salem's thriving community of color and the centuries old traditions of its African-American people, including Negro Election Day and Black Picnic Day, which locally is an annual summer celebration at Salem Willows Park. You may know that. With us tonight is Doreen Wade, president of the nonprofit organization Salem United, which is committed to preserving culture, protecting ethnic traditions, and building community and social awareness. She and her family have spent decades researching their own New England ancestry, which dates back to the 1600s, and the North Shore's Black history. You will be enlightened and you will be entertained by tonight's presentation. Doreen, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. This is a very much a pleasure. But before I begin, I would like to take a moment and I would like you to have see a short presentation. And then after that, I will get come back and get into a lot of discussion. So until then, I will return. The thought of blacks voting in 1740 was unrealistic, unheard of. Slaves voting? Of course not. Slaves could not vote, but slaves of royal blood practice black self-governing called Negro Election Day. In the exhibition, you learned about the two week election debate. One, being chosen governor or king. Then you serve as a judge, mediator, and liaison for the black community. Boston, Lynn, Saugus, Salem, and other New England locations enjoy the day-long coronation festival. The festival involved music, storytelling, and the parade of kings marching in their traditional costumes. These festivals and coronations paved the way for political engagement of emancipated African Americans in later years. We bring you to today's celebration, Black Picnic Day. We have preserved the history of Negro Election Day in our annual celebration. Instead of crowns, we use top hats. And we also honor the female participation in our electoral process. Salem United Inc.'s leadership has received many honors for its preservation of the history. Our quilt is a history of black evolution. Remember, our history did not begin with slavery. It began with royal blood and the ability to empower our people during the most difficult time. And we want everyone to understand it, embrace it, so we can stand up, be proud, and strive to build our community. So I want to take thank you for um, looking at the presentation. Um, I did that because I wanted to give you an explanation of what this is all about and now I wanna bring you to why would I do this exhibit? Why would I take this history and, and make a whole exhibit around it? Um, basically because of the fact that 
this is something that has happened in the in Essex County. It is a very, very, very important history. And I wanted everyone to understand this history because a lot of people go to Salem Willows on the third Saturday in July every year. And it's called Black Picnic Day. But it's more than that. It's more than just a day of a picnic. Its history dates back to when slaves, African slaves, sat down and decided to come up with this, with this voting system so that they could be protected, so that they could um, run their own communities, their own businesses, anything that has to happen. Because when we're taught about slavery, we're taught that we were running around in the cotton fields, picking cotton, um, and basically that is what they frame our history on. Well, it's more, it's a lot more. I start with, if you'll follow me, I'm gonna take you through some of the areas of concentration. I wanted to take you back, back to even West Africa and Ghana where the first king that we discussed in the exhibit is from. Uh, his name was Pompey. And of course, Massachusetts has the dubious distinction of having the first ever black king or governor. So these doors were around their villages. And when they came out to do family things, to do anything that Africans would do, they would walk through this door. This door is called the do, do, no, door of no return. So what would happen is once they were through this door, they were put on slave ships and brought over to this country. Now, many people are under the impression that slavery did not happen in Massachusetts. Well, slavery did happen in Massachusetts. And because of that, the USS Constitution contacted me to put their history in my exhibit because the USS Constitution itself was involved in slavery, but it didn't, it didn't go over to Africa and actually kidnap people and bring them here. What they did is they waited till they came here and were sold on the banks of the Boston Harbor or in Charlestown. And then they would make them take wood trees, cut the trees down and build their homes. So when you go down to Charlestown and you look at the uh, USS Constitution, those boats, those ships were built by slaves. So you heard also me talking about that um, Pompey was the first. Well, he was, he was the first. He was purchased by a gentleman named Mansfield. And at some point in time through his business, uh, to Mansfield's business, because Mansfield's was a clothier. I think that's how they said it, clothier. So they made clothes and he taught Pompey how to do this. So he taught Pompey how to make the clothes, sell the clothes. He taught him to read, he educated him. And through that education, he was able to work with other Africans of royal blood. And basically they put together the first black governing system. So they made their own rules, they made their own regulations. This was approved by the white governor of Massachusetts or by the white governor of New Hampshire or by the white governor of Rhode Island and Connecticut where many, many black men served as kings and governors. And um, the, the land, Pompey bought land and the land that Pompey bought, Negro election day was actually held on it. Negro election day is what stemmed from this black voting system. The whole, there were two weeks, two weeks where they voted, they debated, they, they did everything until they chose one person that would be the king. And of course, you'll continuously hear me talk about King Pompey. So the land that he bought, Negro Election Day was held on that land until it became too big. And when it became big in 1880, it came to Salem, Massachusetts. 
And while in Salem, looking for a place, they established themselves at Salem Willows Park. This was 1880. And you say, well, how do we know this? How can we prove this? Well, right here is an example. I have a picture of Salem Willows Park in 1885. And I always say to people, well, you'll know, because if you look in the back, you'll see the boathouse that is actually still there today. Now you say to yourself, when you look at this, well, Doreen, in most of this picture, there are white people. Yes, it's because while blacks were on one side, making rules, governing, building laws, whites were on another side and they were basically making a mockery of black of the Blacks that were participating in Negro Election Day. So the, we have found out that this is probably one of the first in Massachusetts of a minstrel show, because that's exactly what they did. They put on a minstrel show. However, it became very, very, very powerful and it survived. It survived many centuries, right up until today where we celebrate it, as I said, the third Saturday in July. Now, most people call it Black Picnic Day, but we have to go back. Let's go back and really look at this. Because you say to yourself, well, Doreen, how? How can you go from 1740, calling it Negro Election Day, to 2021, calling it the Black Picnic Day? How can you correlate all these relations so they blend together? Well, what would happen is after slavery was over, there were different people now that took over the celebration part of it. The celebration part of it is what is done today. Back in 1740, they called it Coronation Day because they would meet, they would drink, they would have fun, they would do games much of it, the same thing everybody does today. So when it stopped being an election for Africans, now we are black Americans in this country. So now it has become according to who is doing it. So women started taking it over. And of course, when women take it over, they were servants, they were maids. So they named it after themselves. They called it the maids picnic. And then it went back to, it was one of the first events that was established as Emancipation Day. So on that day, you had a lot of black officials coming into Salem, coming into Salem Willows, and they would host conventions. And then it, the churches took it over. So when the churches took it over, of course, they named it and moved it to Sunday, and they called it Sunday Picnic Day. However, then what happened is a lot of people had to work on Mondays. They couldn't stay out all day. So they moved it back to Saturday and it became colored people's picnic because though during those days, black people were called colored. Now you have the black movement and during the black movement, they changed it to what it's called today, black picnic day. However, I decided that I wanted to restore it. I wanted to build it back to its origin. So I decided to take it over. I was asked to take this, this, this whole event over and build it into what its history is, which is Negro Election Day. So today we are calling it Negro Election Black excuse me, I'm losing my voice because of all the tours I'm doing. We're calling it Negro Election Black Celebration Day. Now you say to yourself, okay, Doreen, that's another name change. Well, in a way it is not. I'm bringing the, bringing the past to the future. I'm bringing its history. What it stands for, I'm bringing back, which is why I am dropping the name picnic because when you hear the word picnic, you think of a gathering, you think of a, 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 of, of a moment of excitement, but that's really not what picnic is. Picnic is a, is a terminology that they use down south 
when they were going to lynch black people. And what would basically have is you would have the whole white community. They would be in a park. They would be eating, drinking, having fun. And then at the same time, they were hanging black bodies from a tree and they were lynching them. So that is the reason why I want to bring back this honor. I want to bring back this history. I want people to understand that this history is the first black voting system in our country. It's the true first emancipation day. Now I know I went through everything quickly, um, but I hope that you will come over to Hamilton Hall any Friday um, from four to six, Saturday from three to 6.30, and Sunday from one to 6.30, and really get a flavor of what it is. Because we can tell you about the music that was brought from West Africa, the drums, how they carved drums out of wood. And they actually brought these drums to this country, not bringing them as we would think over on the ships that where they were slave, but they would bring them, They once they got here, they would take their traditions and their culture and they would carve it. And you know they're real and you know you can tell a true West African drum because the inside of it still today, and I've had this for many, many years, still today, you see the carving, you see the actual wood within the um, drum. So I hope that gives you a little flavor of what we have, what we're doing. Um, but also part of the other part of the exhibit, which I'm not really discussing in depth today, is the suppression of the black vote. That's why we call it unmasking and the evolution of Negro election day in the black vote, because we are bringing in the suppression, which brings us right into modern day. But one thing I like to do is I like to always have that shock figure. So basically, this is one of the histories of black suppression dating back to the 1890s with Jim Crow where they would put jelly beans, actual jelly beans in a jar and they would say, count them. If you count them, you can vote. If you miss it, you can't vote. Well, we all know that the majority of black people back in the 18, late 1800s and early 1900s, especially in the South, could not read. So they were never going to pass it. And there are other forms of suppression that when you come to the hall and you get a chance to see, I will go into discussion and I will go into depth about it. So um, now I bring you to what you saw in the presentation. This represents King Pompey, the first king of Massachusetts and his wife, Phyllis. It could also be Phoebe because in the records it was listed under both names unless her name was Phyllis Phoebe. And most slaves did not have last names, so there was no last name of record. So we are honoring them. And this is actual costume that um, King Pompey would wear while he was king. And you can you can tell that because if you follow me back over here and you look at the picture, this picture down here is actually a king in Connecticut that was riding on his horse. And, he, and you can see the outfit and then you can see the outfit on the mannequin and you can see that, that there's the correlation. And, and basically at whatever state you were in, that is what you wore. Now, if you'd like to, you can, we can go outside for a moment because this history is something that I want to really discuss. But on our way out, I want you to go and get a chance and look at the bill. This is a bill that is in with Senator Joan Lovely and we are trying to get um, Negro Election Day a state holiday. So we have this bill. Anytime you want, you can come down. 
You can sign a petition. We have petitions all over the exhibit hall. But so now follow me and I'll take you outside. And you'll say to yourself, well, why, Doreen? Why should Negro Election Day be a state holiday? The reason why we feel it should be a state holiday is the fact of this is a history, a history where most people are led to believe that Blacks had no voting rights. Well, maybe we didn't go into the voting poll booths and maybe we didn't outright vote like we do today. But the point of the fact is this was an election. They would debate, I'm gonna repeat it again. They would debate, they would choose whom they decided they wanted to represent them in government. And that is how the first black voting system came. So now, uh, many, 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 many organizations have their own flags. You have the gay pride flag, um, you have the Juneteenth flag. Well, now you have Black American heritage flag. This flag is not a new flag. This flag dates back to 1967. It was designed by a Black gentleman who made it because he wanted Blacks to be proud. Um, that's why this, the color is Black, for the pride of their race and their pigmentation. The red is for the blood that we have shed. And the gold is for the prosperity that at some point we hope to gain and have and get rid of all this inequity and, um, and, and have inclusion and diversity. So on that, I will bring us back. And I wanna thank you all for being patient because this is the first time I've ever done a tour going in and out of a building. So this is new. And I thank you and appreciate that you were interested enough to come and sit and view this exhibit. So um, I basically gave you a summary of everything that is going on. And so now, um, now we can have, now we can have a question and answer um, period. If you'd like to answer, ask any question, I will answer it to the best of my ability. Ray, I have a question. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I know that, that you have referred to Pompeii as a king and a governor. Is there a difference or this was just, oh, I don't know. I mean, what's the significance? Yes. It, um, the difference is it depends on the state you're in. Um, and I think I said Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire all had this celebration. And what it is, is in Massachusetts, he was called Pompeii, Black King Pompeii. But in Rhode Island, they were called Black governors. So some of the Africans didn't want to lose their titles of what they would be in their own country. And that's why they maintained king. But in other country and other parts of New England, they wanted that full representation of government. So they called themselves black governors. So I hope that answers. Yes, it does. Um, and so it, whether, whether he's called a king or a governor, they're governing. They're governing. They are the mediated, mediators between the white political structure and the um, Black community. Do we have okay. Okay. Uh, we have a few questions from the audience. Um, were the New England states the only ones that had this history? Um, no, the, we're the only ones that had the voting part of the history. But as far as the coronation part of the history, it was in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, and they called it Pinkster. And actually in um, a part of New Jersey, Pinkster is still celebrated every summer. Just like our coronation would be the um, uh, Negro election black celebration day. 
theirs is Pinkster, and they honor the music, the land, the prosperity, the growth. Wow. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, how were enslaved people able to take a whole day for the election and two weeks preparation leading up to the election? How were they able to take that time? Well, right, yeah. Well, basically, as we know, you had to, slaves had to have permission. So they were given permission by their owners. Um, in the case of Daniel, uh, in the case of Pompeii, Daniel Mansfield and his um, son, Daniel Jr., and his grandson, Thomas, uh, they, they didn't really believe that much in slavery um, as well because they freed him in 1757. So they got a lot of leeway. And, and that was the same thing in Rhode Island and Connecticut. These were men that they knew were of royal blood. So they gave them privileges that most slaves would not have. And for this reason, they got a lot of time off and they could do this. And they also knew the white, the white slave owners also knew that this was bringing them fame and popularity, especially Mansfield. This is something that happened here in Massachusetts and went all across the New England states. So they got fame and popularity for being able to do this. So of course they're going to give them that day off. And then once a year, all um, slaves were given a day off. And that was the day that they chose to either go to Lynn on Pompey's land, or they would go to Salem on Salem Willows. And if I may say, it wasn't just here in Salem. I want people to understand that it also happened in Boston on the Boston Common. However, what basically happened is when Blacks were getting too powerful, they moved Negro Election Day to January, thinking that it would be so cold we would not go out. And that did not happen. What basically happened is we still maintain going out. And then they just made a law that said Blacks cannot congregate on the Boston Common. And that's how it, it, it came to be in Salem. Because now you have Boston, you have Cambridge, you have Medford, you have everyone coming to Salem Willows in 1880 to be part of this event because it was being stalled in other places. Um, did whites influence the outcome of Negro election days in any way? Um, I know the person is not here. I can't, I can't ask to uh, elaborate on that a little, but um, I'm going to assume I know what that question means and I'll try to answer it to the best of my ability. Um, Whites did not have any outcome on Negro Election Day. The only white person that probably would have had an outcome would have been the governor, because the governor is the one who said, this can happen in my state, and he would allow it. But in most cases, That's what been talking about. It, didn't, it didn't happen. OK. Um, do, do you know if the black governors were able to influence specific policies or laws throughout the state? Yes, they did, whatever state it was. Um, now, of course, I did tell you Pinkster was different. They didn't do the governing part. They only did the celebration. So we have to stay within the New England states. And in the New England states, each state, each king or governor in those states developed rules, governed, they would go to the, um, there was one article that I read that said that um, the king would go into the state house building and actually sit with the governor and bring all the ideas that the community brought to them. And they would then say, okay, yes, this could be a policy, that could be a policy. Then the king or the governor would go back into the black community and he would rule, he would punish, they would hold courts, you were tried. 
if you were convicted, the king had the right to have the white um, governor put you in jail. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, and I have one more. Um, someone, uh, Lish is wondering, did the black picnic in Salem exist before the late 1900s? She grew up in Andover where they swam at a place called Pomp's Pond and wonders if this is connected to Pompeii. There is a Pompeii that is from Andover. Um, and I read about him and I had to make sure they weren't the same people and they are not the same people. Um, Pompeii and, and Andover was actually a free man at one point and he was captured and enslaved again and brought back to Andover. So um, there is a Pompeii that represents Andover. And for your other part of your question, um, Black Picnic is Negro Election Day. They are one of the same. What the, the difference is, because we do not vote for a Black king or a governor, we use the coronation part of Negro Election Day. But they are all one in the same. It goes from 1740 to 2021. So when you come next year, you are celebrating and honoring the first black voting system. And by the way, I'd like you to come up to the pavilion and say hello and come and meet me. Cool. Um, oh, we got another question. Um, did Frederick Douglass ever speak at Negro Election Day? We cannot verify that. He spoke in Salem. Um, but the documentation did not say it was during Negro Election Day, so it's hard for me to claim it. But if I could claim it, I would. <laughs> <laughs> but I will tell you that um, if you've ever heard of the 54th Massachusetts Infantry, mm -hmm. they were part of Negro Election Day. Now you say, how do I know that? I know that because I am fifth generation granddaughter to Charles Augustus Potter, who is a member of the 54th Massachusetts Infantry. So I know I can correlate and we actually have records of a couple of Salem residents who were 50, part of the 54th Massachusetts Infantry and they were involved in Negro Election Day. Um, any more questions? I, that's all I have gotten in the chat. Oh, wait, here we go. Um, about the Remen family, can you tell me what you think about this most extraordinary family? I'm learning about them also myself. Um, I I just found out that I might be a distant relative. So I really do have to really start researching this. But I do know that one of the Redmonds was um, one of the first black delegates in Massachusetts. So with that is how we connect the Redmond family with Negro election day, because he was part of when Negro Election Day became known as Emancipation Day and they were holding black conventions in Salem Willows Park. He was part of that. Um, but I, I find them to be an extremely interesting family because to think that in the 1800s, a black family would have their own business is an amazing Salem history in itself. And right here, in Hamilton Hall, and I wish we could go in the other room. Um, I'm not sure if we, if you'll be able to see it well because there's a lot of glare, but in there is the actual kitchen that they cooked in their, in their catering business in. So it, it's, it's very, very amazing. And that's kind of why I'm glad we're all in the same building because we can correlate with each other. 
Um, and since you can't see the chat, Doreen, she wrote yes and totally thank you with lots of exclamation points. <laughs> <laughs> Doreen, I'd like to ask you a little bit more about this bill that you would like people to sign the petition for the bill. Okay. Is it your hope that this exhibit and all of the public awareness that's that's being generated by it, that that will lead to passage of the bill? Tell us more about the legislation. Okay. Well, um, first off, I don't want people to think that I'm passing this bill because now Juneteenth has been passed as a federal holiday. This bill has actually been sitting on the Senator's desk um, in, in, in the state house for three years, we started this. Um, basically the bill, the, the reason why I want it a state holiday is because we're honoring, with Juneteenth, we are honoring the last freed slave. However, I want our country to honor the work that we have done and the contributions that we have given to this country. So by us celebrating the first black voting system, we are basically saying, wow, that is a contribution that should be honored. And as well, while we are in the midst of black voter suppression, what better way for states to say, or for this country to say, wow, okay, if we pass this holiday, we are saying that a black voice counts, a brown voice counts, an Asian voice counts. It is called Negro election day, but my fight is not just for the black community. My fight is for anybody who is struggling with suppression today. That's wonderful. Uh, unless there are more questions, um, could I ask you to repeat the hours of this exhibit at Hamilton? Yes. We're here Friday from uh, 4 to 6.30. I, I cut it a half an hour. It's 4 to 6.30. On Saturday, it is 3 to 6.30. And on Sunday, it is 1 to 6.30. Now, many people like to come in on Sunday because they like me hearing me lose my voice. I am here on Sundays and I do actually walk you through the whole exhibit and give you the personal touch. And I hope that some, you know, I hope some of you will come down and will enjoy um, the personal touch. Mm -hmm. But um, I am here on Sundays from one to six. Okay. Oh, and, and if you'd like to see, this is a picture of the bill. The bill number is 2083. You can call your congressman, you can call your state rep, you can call your senators, you can call the governor and tell them that I saw Doreen's exhibit. They all know me. I call them on a regular basis and say, we would like to really have this bill passed. We have one more question from the audience. You can keep them coming. Okay. Um, so Joy says, I know you've been giving tours and talks to young people. How do they react to this history? Well, I've had two groups. I've had um, five-year-olds in, in a school and they actually, I, I, when I'm going through the exhibit, I try to be age conscious. I try not to say too much that's gonna be overwhelming. Um, th many of them have already heard about slavery. So basically I kind of, numb it down. Um, when I get to the black suppression part, I kind of numb it down. Um, but with the high school now, I just had a whole tour come in from New Innovation High School. I went through every part of this exhibit. They asked questions. They were so interested and they were so excited and they were so appreciated. They invited me to their graduation and I went because I thought it was an honor for them to be here. I thought it was an honor for them to enjoy my exhibit so much that they felt moved to invite me to their graduation. So 
in answer to your question, it's been a positive, positive acceptance from school children to the point where um, I have been asked if I would do black history facts and different things for the school department. So I am going to establish a program called Students Helping Students, and we're gonna make black history facts. We're gonna teach the college students who are gonna teach the high school students who are gonna teach the grammar school students. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to putting that across the country, that program. So from this little exhibit here, I have um, really made uh, a lot of changes and my board has really made a lot of changes that I'm so excited. And I don't want you to think that Salem United, we only do the exhibit and we only do the picnic. We, um, if many of you may know Howard Street Cemetery, there are three people of color in that cemetery and um, they are from here and we are preserving their headstones so that they will be honored from year to year to year. And we're going to other cemeteries and we're gonna do preservation there too. We are also going to have education programs where we're gonna teach you about voting. We're gonna teach you about the US census. We're gonna teach you why you should go to the civil service there and take the test and get a job working with the government where you have it for life and you have security. And we also are gonna teach you about the US Census and why it is very important for people of color, any color, any ethnicity to be on there and to stop thinking like our grandmothers and our great grandmothers where they say they're spying on us. That is not what it is about. Well, Doreen, I want to thank you for your energy, your commitment, and the hard work, all the research that you have done, the contacts that you have made. And you have told us previous to the program that so many organizations have reached out to you yes. and are just opening their doors. Yes. They want this information. They want to help spread it. Could you give a few examples? Oh, there's so many. <laughs> you can start with the Heritage Trail Commission. You can start with the Peabody Museum, Essex Peabody Museum. You can start with, um, oh, there's so many organizations. There, there, there's just too many to think, but I'll just say that so many people in Salem and in Lynn and, and everywhere in different state cities and towns have been just embracing and opening their arms. And if I may shamelessly plug myself, on July 16th, we the flag that I showed you, we would be down Riley Plaza at 12 o'clock and we are going to have the most unbelievable flag raising you have ever seen. We have the Essex County uh, Honor Guard participating. We have the Masonic Lodge participating. We have um, coming to Massachusetts, we have a US State Department ambassador. Uh, I'm going to really, really kill her name, but bear with me, everybody. Gina Abercrombie Winstonly. She's from the US Department in, of State in Washington. She will be here speaking. Senator Lovely will be here speaking. And we are going to come back. We're going to have we're going to have other people in the community, the League of Women Voters, uh, Common Cause of Massachusetts. They're going to be raising flags. They're going to be volunteering for the day, helping us get this whole exhibit and everything done. After the flag raising, everybody's going to come back here, and we're going to see the exhibit. We're going to talk. We're going to have an African drum and um, dance group here. We're gonna have a gentleman singing from the 18th century music. So you can understand this era. You can actually feel it and be a part of it. And we're gonna have lunch until it's all gone and it's run out. <laughs> so um, 
that's going to be our day on the 16th. And um, I'm hoping that you will come down. Those who are waiting to see the exhibit, you can come down on that day um, for the flag raising for all the events. Um, and it would be good because I would love to see the community come together for this event and show that Salem, that Lynn, that Essex County is diverse and we are all here to prove it because to see a sea of a lovely, beautiful people standing in that plaza of all races, creeds and colors and religion is gonna be just so stunning and wonderful. And then to see the honor God doing how they actually do a ceremony to put up a flag and to see how the Masons do the ceremony to put up the flag. Um, it's just, it's gonna, it's just gonna be, you're gonna be in awe. That's all I can say. And it, it will be the first time the flag is flown in the state of Massachusetts. Um, well, let me correct that. There it is flown in Springfield, Massachusetts during Black History Month. But besides Springfield and here in Salem, the flag has not been flown anywhere. This is all wonderful information. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you so much. I, it's just been so enlightening. And I think that we've all learned information that we didn't even know existed. You know, shamefully, we didn't know about this, but you're bringing this to light. And it's just so important. And we appreciate the collaboration with Hamilton Hall and the Salem Athenaeum. Well, I always say I would not be here without you all. You all are the ones that have made this happen. You're the ones that have donated your time, your buildings, um, yourselves to come to spread the word, to let people know, to give me something like this, an audience to be able to speak to. I mean, it is very, very, very valuable to me. And a lot of people do not have this opportunity. So in the future, when I have my permanent spot, which again, if I shamelessly can plug myself, it may be either at Salem State University, Tufts University, or Harvard University, because they all seem to want the exhibit there. But when I am there, I am going to give back to the community as well, because when I see young people who want to have an art exhibit like this, and nobody is gonna give them a chance I'm gonna let everybody know I'm here. I am gonna give you a chance because I'm gonna open up wherever I am to anyone who wants to have a free exhibit. I am gonna give back in thanks of BL, of all the blessings I have had. On top of what you've already done. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been wonderful. Thank you, Doreen. Doreen Wade, the president of Salem United. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to thank everyone tonight, too. I have a little housekeeping matter that I would like to uh, announce for the Salem Athenaeum, a program that's coming up next month on July 9th at 6 p.m. You can join us for a summer salon. And some of you know about these programs on Friday evenings. Well, this one is an evening of stories about citizenship, community, and belonging. Mm -hmm. So on July 9th, 6 o'clock, you can hear several local citizens tell true stories live in the beautiful Athenaeum Garden. No notes, unlike me. <laughs> <laughs> the speakers include B.A. Cornell, Susan DeMarest, Callie Lightfoot, Joe McGurn, and Paul Tucker. And it's hosted by, and this is a man a lot of you know in the Athenaeum community, J.D. Scrimger. Fat checkers, I'm supposed to include this, fat checkers are not included, okay. This is a free event to Athenaeum members and a $10 suggested donation for the general public. And again, I wanna thank you all for joining us tonight. I think it was a wonderful program. Many thanks to Doreen and have a good evening.